What's up, happy people, and welcome back to Tip Lady Catch and Release. So today is Sunday, and that means it is the verse of the week. And it's also Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to any mothers watching out there, and I hope you have a great day. But our verse for today comes from Proverbs 11.30. And I know this isn't really a Mother's Day verse, but this is just what the Lord told me to say. So if he told me to say it, that's what I'm going to say. So... Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the uncompromisingly righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise captures human lives. For God, as a fisher of men, he gathers and receives them for eternity. Now, I think this is one of the most overrated verses. I'd go as far to say it in the whole Bible. whole Bible. The story of Adam and Eve being created, made by God. But when he made them, he made them as adults. So I always thought, like, well, how old were they? Maybe 30? I don't really know. But they were adults. That's an important thing. But they were infants as it came to understanding the knowledge and the wisdom of God. They had just begun their spiritual journey with God. God, on a daily basis, was teaching them. He was speaking into their lives so they could start growing and becoming the people he created them to be. And in the process of that, however long that might have taken, God was pouring himself into them. And he eventually wanted them to get to a place where they were mature enough to handle the lies that the enemy told them that eventually cost them and us the garden. Well, why is that story important to us? Why are you telling us that? See, you and I come into the kingdom as infants, and God begins to pour his word, his spirit, into us so that he can teach us about himself. But you can't get more of God than you get when you become born again. Well, why is it that important? Because the enemy will constantly tell you on your faith journey that you're not in a spiritual position, you're not at a high enough spiritual position to go out and handle those situations. But in reality, you are more than capable of going out and telling others about the God that's inside of you. You have the authority to go out and tell others about Jesus. you got to understand that. You don't have to be a mature Christian to go out and share Jesus with others. You don't have to be at the highest level of your spirituality to tell somebody about God. That's a lie from hell that you're not capable, that you're not qualified. No, 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 no. Don't listen to him. Just let the God that's inside of you spill out in Pour out to the others that's around you. Let him be seen on your clothing. Let him be heard in your words. Let him be felt in the actions you take as you respond to life around you. Let people see Jesus in you. Let people actually see Jesus in you. So let's go out and be trees of life. See, God is so smart that in the very beginning of the Bible, in the very end of the Bible, he uses a tree the tree of life. And in the middle, he comes in with his son Jesus and he says, Jesus is now the tree of life. So think about that. God started everything off with a tree and he's going to finish everything off with a tree. His son. So because we're called to be like Christ, we're called to go out and be trees of life in our everyday life. We need to go out and let Christ, let the tree of life shine wherever we go, because the world is in trouble, and you and I are the salt that preserves the earth. We need to go out and make others salty, make them thirsty. Let's be the salt that preserves the earth, because right now, in our country, in our cities, in our communities, are all filled with these antichrist spirits. They're confused people, and they're trying to confuse us, but today is the day to wave the red flag. Because it's a red flag season, you see. We can't let Satan win. We've talked about it the past three weeks. You can't let Satan take your instruments. We can't let it happen. So God's given us these two trees. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because he said 
I want you to live your life understanding the difference between them, and I want you to choose the tree of life. But how do you choose to be a tree of life? Well, finding life in a tree. Righteousness, the Bible says, is a tree of life. Just like that verse we just read. The fruit of the uncompromisingly righteous is a tree of life. So just go out there and be trees of life. See, other than God and people, the Bible mentions trees more than any other living thing. So from Genesis all the way to Revelation, all those books in the Bible, you're going to see trees. Trees have always played an important role in everything God does. Every significant theological event in the Bible is marked by a tree. It doesn't matter where you look, every single character in the Bible appears in conjunction with a tree. And so the wisdom of the Bible is a tree. Wisdom and trees are connected by the wise man Solomon and then in other places throughout scripture. So let's go back to Proverbs for a second. The ways of wisdom are sweet, always drawing you into the place of wholeness, seeking for her blessings, the discovery of untold blessings, for she is the healing tree of life to those who taste her fruits. Come on, somebody say wisdom. Because when you look at the definition of wisdom, a lot of people will say, right use of knowledge. And that might be true. I'm not saying it isn't. But that's not really the definition of wisdom. See, wisdom is doing the right thing at the right time, at the right place, for the right reasons. Wisdom involves righteousness. They're connected together by wisdom. We become righteous and we live righteous lives. We display the wisdom of God. Let's go back now to the two trees in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You have to understand that these two trees Point out to us who God is, who you and I are, and how the world works, and why evil exists. You really, really need to understand this. They teach us about who God is. They teach us about ourselves and how to base our decisions every day, either to live in the tree of life or to live in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They teach us how the world works. They teach us why evil exists. Evil exists for two sins, only two. You can sum it up in two, that simple. Unbelief and disobedience, just those two. First of all, Adam and Eve actually didn't believe what God said. Eat of the tree and you will die. So their first sin was the sin of unbelief. And their second sin was the sin of disobedience. See, the tree of life is a symbol of access to God. That's why he put it there. He said, this is how you connect to me from the tree of life. So my life will continually flow through yours and you will live forever. You will live perfect. See, the tree of life was meant to be for all people. Kind of a tree of justice and of beauty and of truth and of love and of light and of righteousness and of acceptance. Everything about the tree of life is good. Everything about the tree of life is positive. See, one of the problems we have in the world today is as born again, spirit-filled believers, we are not living out of the tree of life enough because we live in a fallen world. We are constantly surrounded by sin on a daily basis and it often affects us. Sometimes we act like worldly people. We lose our temper. We get upset and the list is endless. But a tree of life is given to us by God to access his presence. And if y'all watched any other verse of the weeks, you know that his presence is powerful. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil opens the door for everything that will ultimately destroy us. It's the door to unbelief. It's the door to disobedience, just like it was for Adam and Eve. See, the sin's the same. The consequence is the same. The only thing that's different is the temptation. It's the door to selfishness. It's the door to being greedy, hatred, wrath. And what does it lead to? Death. And when I say death, I don't mean here on this earth. No, everybody's going to die here, but I mean eternity. Eat of that tree, and eventually you will die. You will lose your eternal life. 
the warning is really clear in Genesis 3.3, and it wasn't just for Adam and Eve. It's for me, it's for you, it's for your friend, it's for every being that's ever stepped forth on this earth. Oh, come on, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. You see, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is available to us on a daily basis, and it becomes a choice. I mean, it's probably not a physical tree that's tempting you, but it's that same snake. So how are you going to choose to live your life? Just stop and think with me for a moment about sin. All sin is a variation of something that was intended to be good. Need me to say it again? All sin is a variation of something that's good. See, alongside every bad choice you've ever made in life, there could have been a good alternative. You could have chosen the opposite of what you chose, rather than being sinful. See, the message from God is really clear. Choose from the tree of life, and you will have eternal life but choose from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and an eternal death will be waiting for you. Die and you will die was his message. So the fruit of righteousness, the Bible tells us, is a tree of life. Now what does it mean by that? He says that if you go out and if you live a righteous life, if you do righteous things for the right reasons at the right time, if you treat others in righteousness, then you'll become to them a tree of life. Because when people see you, hear you, watch you, observe you, they'll be convinced that you have something that they don't have. And they will desire that. They don't know what it is, but they'll want it. So, while we're talking in terms of life, let's talk about some questions real quick, just real quick. What is a great life? I bet every people group has tried to answer that question. What do we mean by a great life? What is a life well lived? So if we're going to answer these questions, we can try to do that, but what would the answer be? What about a noble life? A life filled with purpose and value? What about the reason I'm alive? What intent did God have for me to be here? Who did he mean when he met me? See, the fact of the matter is that just because you're here means that you're valuable. The fact that you're here means God wants you here. The fact that you're born at a certain time means God has something planned for you in this moment. And the most loving thing you can do for anyone else is to show them an example of a godly, righteous life. Let them see us living our lives on a day-by-day -day basis, and let them see goodness in our life, and let them say, oh boy, I wish I had some of that. I wish my life was like that. So our purpose falls under two categories, and I think Jesus said it the best, love God and love people. I mean, Jesus just has this way of talking, and where he makes it sound so simple, yet so complicated at the same time. I just think he said, love me with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, body. Then go out and love others as yourself. Love God, love others. Say it out loud. Love God, love others. But look at the order he said it in. And I'm not going to play around with y'all and tell you how bad you are for not loving others and that you should try harder, you're just not trying enough. I'm gonna be really real with y'all. Loving others is hard. I'd go as far to say, it's impossible to love others if you're trying to do it without God's love inside of you. Come on. Jesus said it that way for a reason. If you want to love others, then you have to have God's love inside of yourself. Come on, somebody. There's nothing better you can do for somebody else than to live a godly life in their presence. Because if you live a godly life, you'll draw attention to God. You don't live for yourself, you live for God. And in the process of that, you'll bring great blessings to yourself. You see, when David is writing in Psalms 92, he sort of wrote out a plan for seemingly all life. And he puts these four verses together. And I'll get into more of Psalms next week, but let's just read it for a sec. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, be long-lived, stately, upright, useful, and fruitful. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, majestic, stable, durable, incorruptible, planted in the house of the Lord. They shall flourish in the courts of our God, growing in grace. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. 
they shall be full of sap, spiritual variety, and rich in the verdue of trust, love, and commitment. They are living memorials to show that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promise. He is my rock, and there is no under-righteousness in him. Y'all, that verse was meant for people who go through hard times, who go through storms and trials, and who go through stuff that really just doesn't feel that good and doesn't seem like I'm a Christian. And if I am, where's God? And why isn't he moving? But he said in your lifetime, if you continue to do this, look at the first couple words. If you are uncompromisingly righteous, you will weather the storm. Your storms will not diminish you, but they will make you. I know it's hard to understand, but what God permits into your life doesn't come to diminish us, but it comes to increase us, to make us more than, bigger than, greater than, stronger than what we've become. Everything God's permitted into our life was for a reason, for a season. See, he's not done with you in the midst of this. You're gonna get through it. See, you will go through things, but righteousness means that the domain of God, where God lives, you and I have been invited into his presence so that we might experience his righteousness. Righteousness is something of a pillar of the kingdom of God on earth. So when we become righteous, we exhibit who God is to others. God sows his righteousness into us so that we can go out into the world and start sowing righteousness in our relationships so that other people can see God in us. Come on, somebody. If you think about it, if you look at the entire universe and you think about how God created the earth and spoke it all into existence, he rigged the universe to respond favorably to righteousness. I gotta say that again. The universe is rigged. The atmosphere is rigged to respond favorably to righteousness. And righteousness isn't just for big things. It's for little things too. And so he rigged the universe to respond favorably to righteousness. And he speaks of loyal, favorable, conduct behavior based on living in covenant with God. Your life will reveal whether you're really sold out to God, whether you really live for Jesus or not. So righteousness in the Bible becomes a term of relationship because it describes a desire to live a life that's pleasing to God and helpful to the other members of his family. So as born-again, spirit-filled believers, we begin to interact with one another and respect one another as God's children. And by doing that, we are sowing righteousness towards God and his people with the same kind of love that God has shown towards us. Come on, somebody. What God has given to us, we can go out and give to others. Because he loved us when we were unlovable. He loved us in spite of our sin. He cares about us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul defines for us how this all happened. How did we get to become righteous? So here's what God did. God the righteous God, the only true righteous one, takes his righteousness and clothes his son in it. And his son comes and pays the penalty for our sin. So the righteous son clothes us in the righteousness of the father. It's not something that you and I can earn. It's not something that we deserve. We couldn't do it for ourselves. So the greatest weapon on earth for a significant life is to live from the tree of life and develop what the Bible presents to us as a righteous consciousness. See, your life is a story of whom you are perpetually becoming. It's a process of becoming righteous. Come on, somebody. You are declared positionally righteous by God. But then you have to work out the righteousness in your life by bringing your behavior under under the word of God and you measure up and you become righteous and on a daily basis you choose either to live out of the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you do your own thing 
where you choose selfishness and you live out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you do your own thing and you make your own plan and you feed your flesh whatever your flesh desires and you live by those choices and by doing that you're enjoying the pleasures of sin but I'm telling you payday will come Jesus is coming back and then you'll really wish that you didn't sin all those times that's the issue you see but if I'm developing a righteous consciousness, what happens to me? Well, Psalms 92 tells us, we begin to flourish like the palm tree, tree and will grow like a cedar from Lebanon. And so his methodology for building great people is, was, and always will be the tree of life or righteousness. Come on, somebody. I hear people all the time asking, why this storm? Why am I going through this trial? Why do I have these things happen in my life? Why is all of hell breaking loose in my life? I mean, y'all probably asked yourself those questions before. But if you get close to God, if righteousness begins to pour out of your life, I can assure you the enemy won't be happy about it. But if the enemy isn't happy, I'm happy. I'm really happy if he's not happy. I may not like the hell that he causes, but I'm really happy if he's not happy. I want to get up on any given day and have a demon report to hell that, oh no, Zayden just woke up again. So what are we going to do? I want the powers of hell to fear what God might do in my life today. Come on, somebody. See, when you have a righteous consciousness, you put things in the hands of God and you say, God, I don't understand this, but because I don't understand it, I'm just going to dump it all on you. That's righteousness, y'all. So this week, this week, this very day, Mother's Day 2023, I believe God wants to use you watching this to make the world not just a better place, but to change people's eternities. All the wrong voices have begun the press. But today it's time we give God a hear. It's time we climb the hill of the Lord with clean hands and pure hearts and say, come on God, move by your spirit one more time. Open heaven and pour out your spirit one more time. Let conviction grip our nation. Help us, oh God. Help us focus on you, even though on a daily basis we are confronted by the challenges of a fallen, sinful world. We're in the midst of fallen people, sinful people. And sometimes we have these little desires to go back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sometimes we want to give into it. But y'all, that's not God's will. That's not God's desire. That's not what he wants for us. But that's also not what he wanted for Adam and Eve. So we daily have to make a choice. So God, help me and everyone watching to live by the tree of life. Right now, we offer ourselves to you. And all week, help us to go out into our everyday lives. Our schools, our neighborhoods, our workplaces. Wherever we may go this week, help us to go out and live as trees of life. Oh God, help us to be righteous in everything we do. So, thank you for watching Tip Lady Catch and Release. Make sure to tune in next Sunday for another verse of the week. Take care, God bless, and we are gone.